Well, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 16 this morning. So if you have a Bible, you can open it there. And as always, we'll start our time with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this moment and this morning where we can gather together as your redeemed people and open your word as your people have throughout the centuries to hear from you, to see you, to see your glory. We thank you so much for revealing Christ to us in our hearts. We thank you for the revelation of him that's deposited here in the Gospel of Luke. We thank you for this one scene with one man who is suffering and for what that reveals about you. We thank you that you love us individually and know us individually and are compassionate towards us. Lord, I pray that you and your love and your character would be exalted this morning in our minds and our hearts, and that you would do your work supernaturally through your word. Thank you for its ability to feed us spiritually and also to build us up as a church. We pray that by your word and spirit, you would do that now. And Lord, I pray for an extra measure of grace to help as I speak, so that I might do it in a way that glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we are social beings. We are social creatures. In fact, I would say that we are intensely social creatures. I lived in Alaska for a year, one year at Bible college before seminary, and it was not in the summer, primarily. So as you can imagine, it was dark and cold. You take a New Hampshire winter and just multiply it several times. And that was my experience there in Alaska. And I worked at a local grocery store uh, for the butcher. And I cleaned his saws each day and knives after he was done. And at various times during the winter, we would have hermits come to the store to stock up for the next several months. I'm not sure if that's a politically correct term anymore. But they were guys who lived way out in the wilderness on their own, typically off the road system. And they would ride snowmobiles on the frozen rivers with a sled or something attached, and they would buy food for the next several months. Now, I know you can't judge a book by its cover, but typically they did not look like they were doing very well. They lived alone by themselves in the wilderness. Even in a bustling city like New York, People often live very isolated and lonely lives, and we are not meant to live that way. We can put that in contrast with how Scripture reveals sort of the most ideal way for us to live, right? We have before the fall in the garden, and then we have after everything is done in the new heavens and the new earth. It's the most ideal state for us to live. There we are surrounded by an innumerable amount of other people, all worshiping together, all enjoying God together around his throne. And the whole atmosphere there is where sin is eradicated and we are saturated with living in the presence of God's glory and God's love. In that sense, it's very clear that we are meant to live together and experience together the care and love of God and also the care and love of one another. And that's reflected in the two greatest commandments, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If everyone did those two things, there would not be a world where we are inclined to be hermits, right? but inclined to live in fellowship with one another. That's the pre-sin plan, and that's the post-sin plan for humanity. We are social creatures created that way, longing to be loved, and also with a great potential to love, but that, of course, is marred by our sinful nature. We are hurt by those closest to us. And also, we hurt those closest to us, typically, in some measure. And so we have this risk of relationships, of getting hurt. We have a hard time with that, and at the same time, we can't live without people 
who love us and are close to us. We have subtle interactions with one another socially that are very complex and nuanced and often very profound. And we are, we could say, most affected in our lives, not primarily by the circumstances, but by the people of those circumstances. And those are colored by our sinful nature in obvious ways. The title for this morning's message is Healing a Lone Leper. Because we can safely assume that in light of this man's disease, he lived a life in so social isolation. Maybe with some other lepers in a similar situation, but very likely for most of his life uh, with that disease, alone and outside of society. This disease was bad enough. Throughout scripture, this kind of leprosy was completely incurable at the time. It was also considered highly contagious. It carried a stigma of having received a judgment from God because of sin. And this kind of judgment and disease only God could heal. And the result was lepers were consigned to a life cut off from the love and friendship and success of normal society. They suffered physically, they suffered socially, they suffered emotionally and mentally. And we know what that's like in part. I would venture to guess that every single person here, unless you are the most beautiful person ever and the most talented person ever and maybe the biggest person and the strongest person, on some level, you know what it's like to be socially ostracized. All you have to do is visit a public elementary school. <laughs> and I was one of them. You would shudder to hear of what came out of my mouth as a young, foolish man. And I felt this way, and I made others feel this way. This man's life is changed because of his encounter with Jesus. Jesus doesn't treat people the way that we did in elementary school or in the shop. His whole life is turned around. Because of who Jesus is, he changes all of that for this man. All all the gospel writers, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, record this event alongside of the next several events. And I think that's important to consider in the context. And they're demonstrating Jesus' power and authority over sickness and maladies, as well as his authority to forgive sins. Luke has already demonstrated for us his authority over spiritual darkness and demons in Capernaum. You remember from chapter 4. And the rest of the day, he begins by healing Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. And then as the day progresses and people find out what's happening, they come from all the surrounding regions to Capernaum, and he heals everybody one day. You guys remember that sermon from several weeks ago. He demonstrates power over demons, then over disease, and he will do so here again. And Luke places this alongside of the next passage where the two are wedded together, power to heal disease or malady and power to forgive sins. Notice as the uh, chapter goes on, verse 17, another scene, one day he was teaching and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there. They bring, uh, a, group, a group of friends bring their friend who is paralyzed and the issue becomes Jesus healing him, but he frames it in such a way to describe it as forgiving this man's sin. They tear off the roof. We'll get there in a couple weeks. Verse 20, it says, seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. And immediately the scribes and Pharisees are outraged because of what Jesus is implying. Who is this man who, who can forgive sins? He speaks blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
And so the two are wedded together. And the overall portrayal in the context here is Jesus' authority to do these things. As the chapter goes on, it will continue this theme of forgiving sins because he will call Matthew Levi, who is a tax collector. Matthew's going to throw a banquet for a bunch of tax collectors and sinners. And the implication in Jesus fellowshipping with them is that he forgives sinners like Matthew and like me. And like all of us here this morning, Jesus has authority to do these things. And there is a progression of seeing this power revealed. Notice in verse 23, when he heals the paralytic, he gives them this rhetorical question. Which is easier to say? Your sins have been forgiven, which is what he had just said. Or to say, get up and walk, which is easier? Which is easier? When I teach on this passage, or will in a couple weeks, that's what I ask. Which do you think is easier? To actually forgive sins or to take a lifelong paralytic and make them walk? It's quite the question. Jesus does both at his word. This is what's being revealed about Christ. The point is, in the context, these realities happen side by side. Disease is gone. Demons are eradicated. Those who couldn't walk are restored. And people's sins and sinners are being forgiven. And all of this reveals who Jesus really is. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And he is God. We'll talk about that um, next week or the week to follow. But also, because he is those things... It means that in part, King, God's kingdom and kingdom realities are now at work. Big things are happening here in the history of redemption, and they happen consistently and are, are centered in Jesus Christ. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke now take this sort of context of his ministry, and they zoom in on this one person to reveal and nuance the way that Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah and as the Son of God and how it pertains to individual people who are in need. As we look at this wonderful scene between Jesus and this leprous man, I want to highlight three qualities of our Savior's character and mission that are revealed here. Three qualities of his character and and mission that are revealed here. In this scene, in some senses, the, the crowds and the popularity fade into the background. And the writers, the apostles, and, and Luke here focus on this outcast, this sick, dying, lone leper as he interacts with Jesus and reveals how Christ deals with individual fallen people. The first and most obvious one to me is his great compassion. His great compassion. Notice how this man first comes to Jesus in verse 12. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now Luke doesn't pinpoint the actual city that he's in. Matthew includes this episode out of chronological order, most likely. And those details are not important to the apostles. The main point here in verse 12 is how this man approached Jesus in his ailment. Two phrases. It says, when he saw Jesus, literally beholding Jesus, he fell on his face. Matthew says that he fell down prostrate like he was worshiping. Mark says that he fell on his knees. And in that posture and desperation, the main verb here is that he implored Jesus or he pleaded with Jesus or he begged Jesus. No doubt he had heard about his miraculous healings that had already taken place, perhaps second hand or third hand. And I wonder, some of the commentaries mentioned that lepers, because they were ostracized, often would group together. We have similar parallels in our society today. And I wonder if he had heard about Christ second hand, third hand, but Jesus had not yet done anything about leprosy. 
So perhaps in their discussions, they were thinking, you know, he healed this disease or that disease. I wonder if he could help me. And the man comes with a measure of faith. Notice that as he speaks to Christ in this brief sentence, he assumes in part that Jesus is able to do this miracle. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Not Lord, if you can, but Lord, if you will. The word there is if you wish or if you are willing, you can make me clean. This is not a question. Lord, can you heal me? This is an assertion. And I think there's a measure of faith there in what Jesus can do. And so he comes desperate. He comes begging. He comes prostrate down on his face with this kind of attitude imploring Christ to help him. Look at verse 13. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Now, that's not a future tense. <laughs> like, I will be clean. No. It's I am willing. I am wishing. This is what I, I desire, what you desire, be clean. And it says, immediately the leprosy left him. And this highlights Jesus' great compassion. And first, his compassion for sufferers. His compassion for sufferers. In Mark's gospel of this account, he makes that very explicit. Mark 1.40, and a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. And then Mark adds, moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And this uh, invests Jesus' words with heavy emotion. This is the Greek verb splognizomai, to be moved with compassion. And the root of that is splognos, meaning literally the guts or the bowels. If you have a King James Version, that's how it translates this term. He was moved with bowels of compassion. And it speaks to the very visceral, guttural, emotional feeling that Jesus had for this man, and it is compassion. On our trip home from our vacation recently, we visited, it was kind of spur of the moment, but we visited with a dear, dear friend who had been wrestling with illness for about the last two years. And at one point, he had a strange virus that lasted for five months, and he was mostly in bed. It was uncertain whether he would, he would live. Our families had been very close, and this was the first time we saw him in those two years. And he's a, he's a lifelong farmer, pretty tough guy. But he was, he was very tenderhearted at our visit and uh, was in tears on a couple occasions. Now, I held out for about an hour and a half. But then when we, we went to leave, I, I just couldn't help but, but start crying. And I have this problem where it's like a hard disconnect switch or a, an old six-inch gate valve. It doesn't open very easily, right? But once it's open, it's really hard to close. But I, you can feel the emotion. That's what this term is. Jesus looked at that man and said these words with that intense feeling. This is the kind of feeling and compassion that Jesus has and is revealing the kind of compassion that God has for those suffering at the effects of a fallen world. God is omniscient and knows every ounce of suffering that we go through. And if you're a believer, then you are a child of God and he relates to you as a child. You can make the analogy with earthly parents and their care and compassion for their children. And God's compassion is greater for his children. He knows in your present life how you are suffering and he promises to be with you through the suffering and even to make sure the suffering for his children has a glorious purpose. David laments in Psalm 56 of his suffering. And at that time, it was how 
uh, the, the Philistines were after him. He says in Psalm 56, 6, they stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? He says to God, in wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. He's saying, God, have my back. And then he says in verse 8, you have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? He's saying, God knows what I'm up against. God knows what I'm suffering because he is my God. He says, then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call this I know, that God is for me. And Paul as well, in a degree of suffering in his ministry, outwardly in his circumstances, but also he's writing to the Corinthian church, which by the time of 2 Corinthians, they disliked him even more than in 1 Corinthians. And unjustly so. There was a group at the church that was opposed to Paul and his ministry. They had all kinds of accusations uh, uh, about him, his physical presence, the way he, he, he preached was not with skilled oratory like the other orators in the Greek sort of culture. All kinds of sort of accusations and criticisms of Paul. But he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, he says, so we do not lose heart. When we're suffering, the temptation is to lose heart. He says, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. When you suffer physically, you can feel that way. My outer self is wasting away. That's the effects of sin in the world. Everyone, everyone will go through that. No one can escape it. Unless we're the, the last generation when Jesus returns. And in that case, it's going to be hard, I think, because of excess persecution. And then he'll deliver us. But if that's not us, every one of us will experience this, though our outer self is wasting away. Every single one. But Paul says, though that's happening, our inner self, the soul, the immaterial soul that's been born again by Christ, is being renewed day by day. How? For this light momentary affliction, that's our suffering, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's what the believer gets in suffering because of God's purposes in suffering. It's preparing an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And Paul keeps that in mind, he says, as we look not to the things that are seen, right? Wasting away flesh as a leper, cancer. We don't look at those things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are seen are eternal. And so he can say, my inner man is renewed day by day while I think about suffering in that way. The point is that God is compassionate towards the sufferer. And as a believer, God is working in the suffering. <clears throat> God providentially allows the suffering, but part of the purpose is to prepare an eternal weight of glory. And this means that God is not distant when you're suffering. God is not cold towards your suffering. God has not forgotten you in your suffering. But he's compassionate, like Christ is here, and he will make it good through the suffering. He has compassion on us, just like this leprous man, and he has compassion for sinners, for those who repent. B is compassion for sinners. So in the one sense, God sees us and can pity us. In another sense, uh, for, for our external suffering, but also is compassionate towards sinners, even though we are guilty. Again, noting the link between this passage and the next, there is in this passage leprosy, and it's met with Christ's compassion. In the next passage, it is this paralytic, right? But Jesus says, your sins have been forgiven, and then he says to him, get up and walk, and the both are together. In the next passage... There is no malady. It's just Matthew, an extortionist tax collector, out for his own gain at the expense of God's people, siding with Rome, extorting money, 
gaining wealth. There's no sickness there, but there's still compassion. Notice when the scribes and Pharisees grumble at this reception that Matthew throws. Notice verse 30. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not, not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are, are sick. See the connection in these three episodes? Here it's not physical sickness. Here it's sin depicted as a sickness. Sin is a crime. Sin is lawlessness. We are guilty. But also sin is inherited, and Jesus here is describing it in such a way that warrants his compassion. And as a physician who can heal that problem, I have not come to call the righteous, he says, but sinners to repentance. There is an opportunity because of Christ's compassion for sinners to be forgiven when they repent. The way this leprous man came to Christ, needy, dependent, with a measure of faith to get to Christ, to be healed, this is the kind of posture and the kind of attitude that every individual person who is a sinner must approach Christ as well. If we were to take the sort of external malady of leprosy and translate that into the spiritual problem of sin, this is how Every person who understands their sin must approach Christ, humble, desperate, contrite, in deep need. This is the depiction of what it means to be poor in spirit. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So spiritually, they're like this leper. Why are they blessed? Because when they come to God in this way, they can receive mercy. We have to know in and of ourselves that we are spiritually bankrupt. And it may be this morning that you have yet to come to Christ. And the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if you look at God's law, there are ways that you have broken his law and done so continuously and repeatedly, sometimes enjoying breaking his law. And it renders all of us in the wrong when it comes to our relationship with God. But when we come this way, humble, contrite, in need, spiritually bankrupt, we meet a Christ who is compassionate. We must simply come like this leper, having heard of a, of a great Savior who is compassionate and powerful to forgive and to heal, and that's who we will meet on the other side of our prayer. How will Jesus respond to a contrite sinner? He will forgive him and restore him, give him eternal life, change his heart, change his life, make him his own, make him a child of God, give him eternity in heaven, restore him, change his character, bless him, provide for him, all of those things to restore us and make us fit for his kingdom. This scene reveals Christ's great compassion, as do so many other events like this where Jesus focuses on one person and heals him. I got to thinking about these points for this morning and thought, you know, this sounds so repetitive. I wonder if I've had this point about Jesus' compassion in a number of sermons yet. And I'm thinking about future sermons and future events where Jesus heals an individual person. Like if I'm doing, if I'm preaching this point now, does it mean that I, I shouldn't preach it in the, the later sermons because it would be too repetitive? I'm just telling you in advance, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to beat this drum about Jesus' compassion as much as Scripture warrants because I think it's all there for a reason. Jesus is great in compassion. Second, this passage and scene also reveals his divine power. His divine power. Now, part of seeing this is understanding that the significance here of leprosy is that in Jesus' day and for centuries before, this disease was incurable. It was incurable. Now, just as an aside, <clears throat> some might say, well, no, it's not. <clears throat> now we know what leprosy is and what causes it, 
and it's very curable. So let me just speak to that for a moment. <clears throat> it's important to understand a term called taxonomy. Taxonomy. It's simply a term used to describe how different branches of science categorize things. I'll give you an easy example. I often say to my kids, I love to grow vegetables in my vegetable garden. And my favorite one to grow is tomatoes. And they will cleverly respond, Dad, a tomato is not a vegetable, but a fruit. <laughs> Maybe you've heard some of those kinds of things before. <clears throat> in my taxonomy, if I put salad dressing on it, it's a vegetable. <laughs> because I don't put salad dressing on any fruits, right? <clears throat> From one uh, website, it says, the botanical classification of a tomato. Tomatoes are fruits, it says. With this definition in mind, tomatoes are classified as fruit because they contain seeds and grow from the flower of the tomato plant, right? When it comes to taxonomy, which includes how do we categorize leprosy today versus how they categorized it in the first century or even 1,500 years later when the law was written in Leviticus 13 and 14 about leprosy, we can understand that the categorization has changed, all right? So I'm not sure when tomatoes were first classified as fruits and not vegetables. At some point, I think it was, I don't know. <laughs> but the point is that taxonomy is somewhat relative, right? It really just depends on the characteristics that you are choosing to emphasize and prioritize. Another example would be whales, right? Whales are what kind of animal? Mammals, right? However, in Genesis chapter 1, they were created on day 5, along with all other animals that live in water, right? So there in Genesis 1, at least <laughs> creation's taxonomy, if, if I could say that, was to, that they were categorized with creatures that live in the ocean. Or we can give another example like a duck-billed platypus. A duck-billed platypus is considered a mammal, according to present-day scientific taxonomy, but it lays eggs. <laughs> it just illustrates that when you choose to put something in a category, it is somewhat relative. The scientific community sort of chooses which characteristics to, that are most primary and says, well, we'll throw them in here. I think duckbill platypus is a great example, right? Lays eggs? I don't know. Fowl, I'm thinking? Maybe mammal? The point is it's relative. Same thing here, I believe, with leprosy, okay? Especially in the Old Testament, there's a certain Hebrew term for that. <clears throat> Over 3,000 years ago, and when we read Leviticus 13 and 14 and how it was to be diagnosed in uh, Israel by the priests, we get the sense that the term encompassed a broader degree of diseases. Some uh, skin diseases, but it looks like what they're looking out for there is uh, uh, symptoms of skin disease that could lead to more prominent and um, life-threatening or community-threatening forms of leprosy. In our day, leprosy refers to the one single type of disease that's called Hansen's disease, named after the man who identified its essential cause. And today, other doctors have demonstrated that Hansen's disease, or what we call leprosy, affects the nervous system so that if you get injured or burned or an infection or a cut that gets infected, the victim can't feel it. And so what happens is aggravated health complications on the outer skin and the body parts. Not so much in the first century, not so much 1,500 years earlier in Leviticus 13 and 14. <clears throat> but all throughout those centuries, the dominant theme was that leprosy was incurable. They didn't know what to do with it. 
We hear this in 2 Kings 5, when Naaman the Syrian, who has leprosy, hears that there is a prophet in Israel and wants to go and seek treatment. It says at one point there in 2 Kings 5, verse 5, the king of Syria, this is Naaman's king, said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Sort of like this delegation. So he went taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. All right? So in Israel, uh, they figure they, they have the means to cure this. And so in desperation, the king of Syria sends Naaman with this delegation to the king of Israel. Right? Now notice what the king of Israel says in response. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God? to kill and to make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? What he's saying is, am I able to do the impossible? And this just highlights how leprosy was viewed. It'd be like cancer today, right? There's no real clear cure. There's treatments, but it's a serious illness. Same thing in Moses' day when the law was written. Same thing in the days of Elijah. Same, things in the day, same thing in the days of Christ. It was considered an incurable disease, a cure which only God could effect. Verse 13 here in Luke 5. It says, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be clean. I am willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. This is very similar to what we've seen in Christ's miraculous power. He commands the demons, and they go immediately. He rebukes a fever in Peter's mother-in-law, and immediately she gets up and serves them. He will rebuke the wind of a storm, and immediately it will stop. He will pray and miraculously multiply bread. He will say to people who are dead, arise, and they will come back to life. The disciples see him calm the sea, and they say, who is this man that even the sea and winds obey him. And they're asking exactly the right question. The dead rise. Leprosy immediately goes. Who is this man? <coughs> Excuse me. With all of those things together, his power outsurpasses any prophet before him. Only God does these kinds of things. Only God does these kinds of things. I love the exchange between this leper and Jesus. If you are willing, you can make me clean. I will, I am willing, be cleansed. This highlights that Christ's power to do these things is an exercise of his will an exercise of his free will to do these miraculous things. Only God does that. Every other prophet before that is a mediator for God at the disposal of God's will and God's instruction to effect the miracles. And Jesus, in some sense, yes, is submitted to his Father's will, but here what's highlighted is, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, he is cleansed. It is the free exercise of God's power and God's compassion that heals this man. And it's the free exercise of God's compassion and God's power that forgives the sinner as well. Jesus is the source of that power for you and me. He is the uniquely qualified Savior for suffering sinners like you and I. Do you realize he had to be made flesh? He had to be incorporated as a person. He had to be localized in a certain place. He had to die on a cross so that all humanity could be restored to God through this one God-man who could forgive us. He is the source of this for you and I. He is the only one qualified to do so, to deliver us from the suffering that came from the fall into sin the guilt that we have on our part when we sin. And he suffered and died so that we could be forgiven. He suffered in our place and died in our place so that one day we could be permanently 
healed and restored and forgiven. There's something else to consider here in Christ's response and in his, in his power on display. Notice again verse 13. It says, And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Again, I think for the crowds there, this would have been sort of the height of the scene. If you remember the feeling during COVID-19, it became sort of the, the absolute public unpardonable sin to cough in public. Right? <laughs> you remember that? You'd be at the DMV, masked up, and you have a frog in your throat, and you'd, and you'd just be like, I don't want anybody to hear me doing anything cough-related. Because you just see people sort of scatter, right? And they're wondering, why are you out in public, right? This is worse for leprosy in first century Israel. Nobody touches this guy ever since he got leprosy. There's a certain distance he has to stay away from people and crowds. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. He could have just said, I will be cleansed, right? I'm willing, be cleansed. But he stretched out his hand and he touches him. This might have been the first touch from another human being in years for this guy. People didn't touch lepers because <clears throat> the law prohibited it. And it was to protect Israel as a nation from those, those broader diseases that were contagious. It was part of their sort of public health policy to protect the nation from its spreading. You can go back and read Leviticus 13 and 14 to, to see the nuances of how the priest was to diagnose uh, whether uh, an initial symptom on the skin was really leprosy or not. There was a certain time frame for the priest to watch the symptoms develop, and then there were certain sort of uh, levels of the degree of severity, and then also things that the priest was to look out for, for if the person was uh, recovering from their natural immune system. And, and the priest was the, the one to declare whether the person had to quarantine or whether they could be restored back to regular society. But this man was ostracized, and no one could touch him because of fear of contagion. He would have been considered for all that time in his sickness to be, to be ceremonially unclean, could not go to the temple, could not offer. And people, would, other Israelites, would avoid touching him so that they too would not become ceremonially unclean. You know, if you, if you touch someone with leprosy in that broader sense of the term, you might have um, uh, uh, caught that and it would take time for it to develop. And so you would have to be considered unclean so that you wouldn't spread this around as well. When Jesus touches him, however, he's not rendered unclean. We see a similar example later on in Luke chapter 8 with the woman who has a discharge of blood for 12 years. That also was considered in the Levitical code, to render someone, this woman, unclean. And she had been unclean for 12 years. And in that occasion, Jesus does not touch her, but she touches him while he's surrounded by a crowd of people. The result on both occasions is not that Jesus then becomes ceremonially unclean. The direction would be someone who has these either maladies is, is rendered unclean, and then if they come in contact with someone else in Israel, they are also considered unclean, right? And so it has that sort of direction like uh, uh, of contamination. But when they both touch Christ, the opposite happens. They are healed and restored. They are cleansed, right? This happens, this themes, this sort of dynamic of a theology of holiness typically happens of moving from something that is holy, coming in contact with something that is common or profane, and then being rendered unholy and profane. And the equivalent, something that is clean, coming in contact with something that is unclean, then being rendered unclean. But not with Christ, and not with a few things in the temple or tabernacle, that were most holy. 
You can go back and read in Exodus a few things that were most holy. When things came in contact with them, they were rendered holy. That's what's happening here, I believe, with Christ and his power. Jesus touches him, and he's not contaminated, and he's not unclean. The opposite is happening because he is the most holy of all. This man is healed, the woman with blood is healed, and they are both cleansed and sanctified and make, made clean. This scene reveals his great compassion on this man. It also reveals his divine power to heal him with a word and also to cleanse him to the full. And then the scene changes somewhat in tone. We see his great compassion, his divine power, but then also the scene shifts to highlight, I think, his primary purpose. Notice what happens there in verse 14. It says, And he charged him to tell no one, but, quote, Go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So the three things happening as this scene closes. One, Jesus forbids this man to speak about it, which we know from Mark's gospel he doesn't do, and you probably wouldn't either, right? He broadcasts it. The second thing Jesus does is he commands him to obey and fulfill Leviticus 14, the sacrificial procedure after someone had been healed from leprosy. And the third thing he does is he intentionally withdraws from the crowds. And I think we're left asking, why is that? Why does this scene end this way? And why, especially, does Jesus do these two similar things of forbidding him to speak about it and then also withdrawing from the, the crowds? And this is actually a consistent theme at this point in his ministry. Why is that? I think the easiest one of those three to answer and consider is the second. Why does he command this man to obey Leviticus 14? Well, in Leviticus 14, <clears throat> chapters 13 and 14 go together. Chapter 13 is sort of the diagnosis and prescription for the various levels and occasions of leprosy in Israel. But chapter 14 for the priests is what God commands them to do to restore someone who has been healed of their leprosy. They're no longer going to be considered unclean and, and therefore distanced from society, but rather welcomed back into normal Israelite society and especially uh, back to the worshiping community. In Leviticus 14.1, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then if the case of the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop, and the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware, earthenware vessel over fresh water, and it goes on in its prescription." And as it continues, the point is that the healed leper is then at the tabernacle with this priest. The priest has diagnosed that, yes, indeed, the leprosy uh, is, is, is in the process of being healed. This man can be considered cleansed now. <clears throat> and he is going to be atoned for, anointed with oil, and restored to the worshiping community of Israel. That's the point of Leviticus 14. And this is what Jesus sends this man to do in response. He had been miraculously healed by Christ, and now Jesus wants him to keep covenant and be restored to society in Israel. And to do so, he says, as a testimony to the priests. Notice at the end of the verse there, it says, <clears throat> do this, as Moses commanded, in verse 14, as a proof to them, or New American Standard says, as a testimony to them. 
I think Jesus has in mind as a testimony to the priests that God is at work in Israel. So on the one hand, he doesn't want him to tell anyone about who has done it. But on the other hand, go and do this as a testimony to the priests of you fulfilling the law that God is at work in Israel to heal lepers. In Mark's gospel, it says in Mark 1.43, but he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. He tells him to obey Moses. It says in verse 45, but the man went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. So that's the reason we have here in Luke chapter 5, verse 15, but the news about him was spreading even farther. And large crowds were gathering to hear, hear, hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. So this man goes about telling what Christ had done. Everyone had heard all of the other miracles that had happened in Capernaum. And the crowds are growing even larger. But it says there in verse 16, But Jesus would often withdraw away to the wilderness and pray. Why does he do this? Well, I think throughout his ministry, there is a tension. And by the way, if you want to jot down a couple of references, we hear this theme repeatedly throughout his ministry. Luke 8.56 and then two in Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, verse 30, and 12, verse 16. Matthew 9, 30, and Matthew 12, 16. And then also in Mark 1, 34, Mark 3, 12, 5, 43, 7, 36, and 8, 26. So Mark emphasizes this theme the most. Why does Jesus do this? Why does he tell the man not to, not to speak about this? Why does he then withdraw from the crowds? Well, I think the answer is that there is a tension in Christ's ministry in his first coming. There is a tension in Christ's ministry in his first coming. And the tension is between who he is and what he must do. The tension is between who he is and what he must do in that first coming. On the one hand, he is, of course, the Messiah, the Son of God, the King. And in all of these miracles, and in all that he's doing in this first phase of uh, his main Galilean ministry, his public Galilean ministry, is to demonstrate in one sense that the kingdom is here. And he wants them to know that he is the king, the Messiah. Just a couple verses to, to highlight this theme. In Matthew's gospel early on, Matthew 4, 17, when Jesus begins his ministry, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand, right? The kingdom of heaven, the long awaited kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, same thing the long-awaited kingdom that the prophets foretold of, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Israel. Therefore, repent, because it's here. The kingdom is here. Later on in his ministry, the same kind of power that he has on display to, to demonstrate and authenticate that message, to demonstrate that, yes, the kingdom is here in power because of these supernatural things that he's doing, that same message and power he delegates to his disciples in Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and over all disease. Sound familiar? And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And if we consider the beginning of the first sort of event here in Luke's gospel when this Galilean ministry began. Remember, he was at the synagogue in his hometown in Nazareth, where he's eventually rejected, but he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, right? Remember that? It's Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, 
which said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news, good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You remember his sermon? Short sermon? He says to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. If you go back to Isaiah 61, that whole section is about the kingdom. So this tension begins with Jesus on the scene as the king, demonstrating through his message and miraculous power that the kingdom, in one sense, is here. And I think he wants them to know exactly who he is in that sense. Israel has got to see, feel, experience, and know that he is the king. And there should be no doubt in their minds after seeing what they saw. But the tension comes because they want them to know who he is because of what he must do. In other words, the kingdom is at hand, and all of the kingdom's features throughout his ministry are really just tethered to him, right? They're not happening anywhere else that Jesus is not in Israel. The promises of the kingdom is that these things will happen to Israel as a nation. But yet there is no deliverance from Rome. There is no full regathering of Israel from the nations. There is no complete overhaul of the curse in the land of Israel. There is no abundance of agricultural blessings that God promises in the prophets related to the kingdom. There is no overhaul of sin's curse in Israel, except where Christ is in, in the immediate surrounding uh, vicinity, and especially relationally and with individual people. Kingdom things are happening, but when they do here and in other places, Jesus withdraws. So in the one sense, to see who he is, but then also the tension is that the cross has to come first. In one sense, the kingdom is here in part, but it cannot and will not come in full yet. Why? Because the cross has to come first. And I think when Jesus withdraws from the crowds, at these points that seem high in his popularity, that seem right when his power is on full display in a wonderful way, that people respond in the right way, then he says, don't say anything, and he withdraws, withdraws. Why is that? Because his primary purpose is for the cross, is to go to the cross. So why does he even demonstrate his kingdom power? It's so that when he's hanging on that cross, they'll know exactly who is there. They'll know exactly who is hanging on that cross. Because in order for the kingdom to come, Isaiah 53 has to happen. In order for Isaiah 61 and 65 and 66 to be a reality, Isaiah 53 has to happen. Where the servant, the Messiah, the king suffers on behalf of his people and lays down his life on behalf of his people and offers his soul as an atoning sacrifice for his people. And Christ knows this to the full. And I think it says here, when Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray, I think that that's what was on his mind and his heart. He sees this leper healed. He sees the flocks coming. And he knows this is my will for Israel and my people, for them to be healed and restored and fully redeemed and on into glory. That's what he wants. But he knows it cannot happen before the cross. Turn over a couple pages to Luke chapter 9. And every, everyone, every commentator on Luke points this out. There is a hinge point in Luke's gospel. And his ministry and popularity and power build up to this point. And then there is a shift in verse 51. It's not marked by the chapters. It probably should be. Luke 9.51. And you can mark this in your Bible. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, or he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. 
because he knows this is his mission. And from this point on, this is going to be the dominant pulse of Christ's movements throughout the book of Luke. It's because the cross has to come first. For a paralytic in the next passage in Luke 5 just to be frankly forgiven, or a sinful woman in Luke 7 just to be forgiven, or the Peter of earlier in Luke 5 to say, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, and then to be forgiven, or the prodigal son in Luke 15 to be restored as a picture of our salvation, or for Matthew Levi next to be received to Christ and, and forgiven for any of them or any of us. It has to be the cross first. Jesus, the great king, the sinless savior, the one who could with his own will and word and a touch heal a leper and calm a storm and raise the dead who never sinned. He'll go to the cross to be your substitute, to stand in your place for the sin debt that you and I owed to pay in full to atone for our sins. Our forgiveness is now, and our healing, our full healing, will come when he returns. It'll come when his kingdom comes. It's here in a glimpse. It will come when he returns. Right now, we don't see his unbridled power in miracles on display. But that healing, a paralysis, of leprosy, a blindness, will go right along with forgiveness of sins, which we have now when he returns and establishes his kingdom. And that's where we're meant to live. That's where we're meant to live. That's where we're meant to flourish, where we're meant to experience the greatest delight and joy of our souls, to be loved by God, to bask in his glory, to be loved by others, to be transformed from impoverished spiritual lepers to fully restored, healed men and women. And we'll be like that for all eternity. That is Christ's will. That is why he died. What a great, great Savior we have. Great in compassion, unchanging compassion, great in power, and great in purpose. I don't know about you, but I long for the day when disease is gone, when death is gone, when every social isolation is gone, when our interaction with one another doesn't include pitfalls and fears and risk of being hurt, but when we'll be full of God's love and glory. And this comes through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. He is a door through which we can enter these things. He is the great healer, and the shepherd of his sheep. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this scene. I pray that this picture of you and your character would be crystallized in our mind, that when we feel like outsiders, when we know that we are unclean in our own sin, when we face suffering, that this picture of you and your character would encourage us would remind us of your heart and your compassion, your power to heal, your power to forgive, and it would help us, Lord, in those moments. Father, I also pray for anyone listening this morning who has yet to come to a saving knowledge of you. Draw them to yourself by your spirit. May their faith be like this leprous man who came desperate and in need calling on you for healing. Lord, may they call upon you today as their Lord and Savior. We ask that you would do this work in Jesus' name. Amen.